Now, we finished up last week in verse number 20, where after pointing out how um, essential the resurrection is, basically, you know, in, in, in the fact that if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, our faith is vain. In other words, it's empty, it's pointless, um, it's worthless. Paul now stresses the fact that Jesus did rise from the dead. Jesus did rise from the dead. And he actually calls them the first fruits of them that sat. The first fruits. He says in verse number 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Now some people might say, well, how could that be? I mean, how could Jesus be the first of the people to rise from the dead? Does that make sense? How could Jesus be the first one to rise from the dead? I mean, didn't Jesus himself raise people from the dead? Yep. I mean, probably the one that springs to mind, Lazarus. Think about Lazarus. I mean, obviously there's various other, other people, you know, the Buddha's son and stuff like that. But, you know, and there's other people. I mean, some of the other prophets raised people from the dead as well. How can, how can we say that Jesus is the first fruits of them that slept? How could he be the first one that's raised from the dead? Well, here's the thing. When you think about it, the difference was that Jesus rose, and when he rose, he wasn't going to die again. He rose to die no more. In fact, if you look at, um, keep your finger in 1 Corinthians 15, but look at Romans chapter number 6, which we sang just before. Look at Romans chapter number 6 and verse number 9. Romans chapter number 6 and verse number 9. It says, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died under sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And so that's the difference. That's the difference in Jesus' resurrection that, you know, it's to, Jesus, he rose from dead to die no more, to never die again. Look back at 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verse number 21, 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 21, he says, look, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. You see, death came by who? By the man Adam. Death came by Adam, but life comes by Jesus, who is called um, the last Adam. And that, if you look down in verse number 45, I think it is, in verse number 45 it says, And so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam made a quickening spirit. And so Jesus referred to as being the last Adam. In fact, if you would uh, turn back to Romans again, I should have told you to keep your finger there, so Romans chapter number 5. Look at Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 8. Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 8. Romans 5 verse 8, it says, very familiar verse, we, we um, say this one each time we're going out soul one, it says in Romans 5 8, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we be yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then he says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. So this is referring to Adam. As by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam, that's that one man. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offence, so also is the free gift. For if through the offence of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So notice you've got that one, Adam, leading to many dying, but then you've got that one Jesus leading to many living. Verse number 16, And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For if the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offences unto justification. For if by one man's offence death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. And notice, righteousness is a gift. You know, Paul said, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is by the faith of of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. He says, The gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offence of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. 
For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So notice, whose obedience makes us righteous? It's Jesus. It's his obedience that makes us righteous. Turn back to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So what they're saying is, everyone who remains in Adam, what's going to happen? They're going to die. Everyone who remains in Adam is going to die. But everyone who is in Christ will live. You know, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so what we see is that the, you know, the salvation is found in Jesus Christ. It's by being in Christ. That's how we're saved. That's why it says... Um, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So this is, this is not teaching universalism. This is saying everyone's going to die, but then because of Christ, therefore everyone's mm. going to live. It's everyone who's in Christ. Everyone who's in Jesus Christ will live. We live by him. Look at verse number 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. You see, there is an order to the resurrection. Christ, as we saw, Christ is what? He's the first fruits. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. You know? Then when he returns, then what's going to happen? Guess what? There's going to be a whole pile more resurrections. The saints, they get new bodies. And notice also it says here that it says the word coming. It says, then cometh the end when he shall um uh whoops a daisy. Of verse number 23, every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Now, some people teach that when believers get their new bodies at the rapture, they say that's a different event than the second coming of Christ. You people say, oh, you've got the rapture here, but then the second coming of Christ, that's a different occasion. But here's the thing, on many occasions when Jesus' return is mentioned, it refers to it as what? The coming. It refers to it as the coming of Christ. You see, look, Jesus has already come one time. You know, he came, you know, in a manger at Bethlehem. He came that first time. Well, guess what? The next time he comes, what would that be? That would be the second coming. You know, look if you would at um, second, uh, sorry, First Thessalonians chapter number four. First Thessalonians chapter number four. This is a uh, probably one of the most well-known passages on the rapture. First Thessalonians chapter number four and verse number thirteen. First Thessalonians chapter number four and verse number thirteen. It says. Page 1193, it says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Paul doesn't want the brethren at Thess Thessalonica, he doesn't, he doesn't want the Thessalonians to be ignorant. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. He says, I don't want you to be, I don't want you to sorrow concerning, the, you know, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant about people, um, uh, people who have died, people who are asleep, that's who he's referring to. I don't want you to sorrow as people that don't have hope. Because, I mean, isn't it a sad thing when someone dies? Mm. When someone dies, that's a sad thing. Yeah. But here's the thing. When a believer dies, when someone sleeps in Jesus, you don't have to sorrow in the same way that the unbeliever sorrows. He says, look, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. So this is referring to people, saved believers, people who have died, they're, but they're sleeping. They're sleeping in Jesus. It says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. What's it referred to? The coming of the Lord shall not prevent or go before them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So the people who have already died in Christ, those who are saved, those people who are alive first, then we which are alive and remain, people who are still alive when Jesus comes back, will, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So it's saying, look, you, that's why we don't have to sorrow as others which have no hope. But also notice what he says, it's referred to, this is the coming of the Lord. Now, the thing is, the same people who teach that the rapture and the second coming are different events, they also teach that believers, they won't go through the tribulation. They say believers won't go through the tribulation. But that doesn't line up with Scripture at all. If you look at Matthew chapter number 24, Matthew chapter number 24, and verse number 29, Matthew chapter number 24, and verse number 29, and of course this is a passage where Jesus' disciples, they asked him, they said at the start of the chapter, he says at um, verse number, verse 3, 
And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming unto the end of the world? And what does Jesus start off by saying? Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. So he says, when it comes to my coming back, when it comes to the end of the world, he says, look out that someone doesn't deceive you. Watch out that someone doesn't deceive you. Because look, in fact, and you go through the chapter, he says, look, many will come in my name saying, I am Christ. He says, but no, don't believe it. Don't believe it. Because he says, when I come back, it's going to be like, you know, as lightning shines from one end of the heaven to the other. And you're not going to miss it. Because there's been a lot of times when people have got, I mean, there's a group in our, our town, what are they called? The um, World Mission Society. World Mission Society Church of God, and they go around with their, with their iPads and, yeah. and, and, and all that sort of stuff. And, and look, and they teach that, well, Jesus came back. And where did he come back? South Korea. You know? You know, they go into this, all this heresy about the Mother God and all sorts of yeah. stuff like that. But look, Jesus said, look, when I come back, it's like you're going to see from one end of heaven. It's not that he came in the secret place. In fact, he goes and says that in the chapter. Verse 26, Wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert... Go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers. Believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. What that means is, guess what? He didn't come back secretly to the Watchtower Society either. He didn't show up in Brooklyn, New York and tell them some secret things and no one else knows about it. Yeah. You know? It's nonsense. It's not true. He says that's what's going to happen. But then, because what this chapter describes, it talks about how there's going to be tribulation. Great tribulation as has never been before. Look down at verse number... Verse 29. He says, look, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet because notice, well, in fact, we're going to look at a trumpet later on in 1 um, Corinthians 15, but didn't we see the trumpet? The Lord himself shall, 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 shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead of Christ shall rise first. He shall send his angels with the sound of that trump. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other. So that's what's being described. It's being described, look, this is going to happen after the tribulation. But people, some people say, well, no, actually there's no signs at all of Jesus coming, and he could come back any minute, and all of a sudden, you know, there's the move left behind, that, is that one of the is the movie called that? Something like that? Yeah, it's a thief in the night. Thief the night. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were all pretty yeah, all that sort of stuff. And but look, it's teaching stuff that, that's different from what the Bible said. Because yep. when Jesus' disciples asked him, "What's going to be the sign of your coming?" He didn't say, "Well, actually, there's no sign. I can just turn up any time." He said, "Well, no, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen." Yep. Anyway, let's get back to First Corinthians chapter number fifteen. First Corinthians chapter number fifteen. But there's an order that things happen in. Yep. Verse number twenty-five. First Corinthians fifteen. Verse number twenty-five. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. You see, Jesus Christ, we need to understand, Jesus Christ is Lord of everything. He's, he's, he's the Lord of death. That includes death, that includes hell. You know, it says in Revelation chapter number 1, verse 18, it says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus, he is the one. He is the Lord of all. Look at Revelation chapter number 20. Revelation chapter number 20. You see, because the Bible talks about how death and hell are actually going to end up being cast in the lake of fire. Look at um, Revelation chapter number 20. <coughs> Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 11. It says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You see, ultimately, death and hell... And when it talks about hell there, that's the current place where the lost are. That's when, the dead, when, when someone who's lost dies, they go to hell straight away. But what's going to happen at the end is death and hell actually get cast into the lake of fire, which, I mean, which we would refer to as hell as well. Okay, Because there's, there's the place where they are right now, but then they come out, they get judged, and then they're cast into everlasting fire. That's what the Bible says, and that's, the Bible says that 
into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You see, the um, what's going to happen is, look, death itself is going to be done away with. Death itself is going to be done away with. I mean, you see it being cast like a fire there. But look, if you look across at the next chapter, look at chapter number 21, verse number 1. It says, that I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. No more death. Neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst for the fountain of the water of life freely. Notice, it's free, costs nothing. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. It says, he that overcometh. And who is he that overcometh? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. But, in contrast to that, the fearful, and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So you've got the two choices. You know, because that encompasses, I mean, all lies, that encompasses everybody, except for the people in verse number seven. He that overcometh shall inherit all things I will be his God, and he shall be my son. You see, the second death is eternal, but the re regular death, that's something that's going to be no more. There's going to be no more death. Because the thing about death is, death is not a natural thing. Death is not a natural thing. And, and so I think there's something inside us which knows this. That's, why, that's one of the reasons why people don't like to think about it. They don't like to talk about it. Death, it's, sort of a, it's a bit of a taboo Subject, you know, because it's one of those things. It's like it's like the elephant in the room. Mm. It's the elephant in the room that we all see because you know we all grow and we grow older and we grow older and time. You know, our, our bodies. You know, we, we we grow bigger and stronger and then we start to grow weaker and more feeble. That's what's happened. It's sort of the way up and then it's the way down. Mm. And some of us are you know are, are, are closer than others. But you know the thing about it is death is an intruder. Death is an intruder. It, and it came into the world. We saw that back in Romans 5. It came into the world. Why? Because of sin. Romans 5, 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Look back at 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 27. The last thing that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he has accepted which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. When Jesus, when Jesus conquered all, he will still be subject to the Father. When Jesus conquered all, he will still be subject to the Father. So people might, people might ask the question, does that, that mean Jesus and the Father, are they, are they one and the same? Are they one and the same, or are they different people? You know? Because, I mean, look, you've got the Son, you've got, he's handing it over to the Father. Well, in this verse, it certainly looks like they're different people. But here's the thing we need to realise, that look, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. <coughs> you know? I mean, I won't... Go through it all. We've gone through this before. Look, Isaiah 9 6. Yeah. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And, is, um, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called, called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Yeah. That's all in one. You know, in uh, 1 John 5 7, it says, For there are three that be a record in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And the scripture after scripture, you can see, look, there are places where, the, where you can see, look, it's clearly different. The son's handing things over to the Father. But here's the thing. You know, you can turn right back at the start in Genesis. Let us make man in our image. You can see that the plurality of God. But how much does the Bible refer to God? How, much, how many times does it say, Thou, O Lord? What's Thou? That's singular. That's singular. You know, I am the Lord. I change not. You know? And so we need to realize it's look, it's both. It's both. That 
the different and did and did the same. How could that be? Well, I don't know. You can ask God. <laughs> but look, he said it. He said it. He said it. But it must be true. Look back at um, verse number 29. Verse number 29. It says, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? Now, <clears throat> this verse here is not just some isolated verse that promotes some strange new doctrine. <coughs> Okay, I don't know if you've heard of this, but there's a, there's a strange doctor, there's, there's a Mormon teaching of baptism for the dead. Okay, and, and if you look up various commentaries, and they'll, they'll talk about, now this is pretty hard to understand. Look, this is not hard to understand at all. This is not difficult to understand. We're in this chapter. We've been talking about, started out with the gospel, which is what? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And all the way through in this verse, what we talked about last week, it's all about, guess what? The dead rising. Some people say the dead don't rise. Well, guess what? The dead rise. Because if, you know, if the dead don't rise, then Jesus didn't rise. And if he didn't rise, our faith is vain. Okay? So then we come to verse 29. What shall they do which are baptized for the dead? So <coughs> baptism is a Christian ordinance. It's mentioned a lot in the Bible. I mean, think about the Great Commission. You know? It says, go therefore and teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. So, baptism, so guess what? Well, if someone's getting baptized, why are they baptized for the dead? Who could be the dead person that we'd be talking about in this chapter? Jesus was the one who died and rose again. Whose name do people get baptized in? The name of Jesus. So that's what this is referring to. He says, look, it's just still part of the same continuing argument. It's saying, look, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then why would we be baptised for someone who didn't rise from the dead? Okay? Why would we do that? Why are they baptised for the dead? But the Mormon church, they have this strange idea that is where, you know, because they think baptism is part of salvation, you've got to be baptised in order to be saved. So what they say you've got to do is, well, we need to baptise, we can baptise on behalf of someone else. Because a lot of people, they've already, did, already died. You know, and maybe there are people around who they didn't get a clear presentation of the gospel. Not that you would get it from a Mormon missionary anyway, but you know. And so they think, well, what we're going to do is, and, and they, they're one of the most, the groups that sort of really into genealogies. And interesting, what the Bible, what's the Bible say about genealogies? It doesn't say something like avoid genealogies. I think it does. It says avoid genealogies. But no, they get into genealogies because they go back and, you know, Aunt, Aunt Sue and, you know, Uncle Fred and, but historical figures. You know, they, I think they, it was the big. It was in the papers maybe ten years ago, something like that. Where they they, they had all the lists of like the Holocaust people who died in the Holocaust, and they were getting baptized on their behalf. And the, the Jew, Jewish people got really offended by you know, well, look, we're not Mormons, you can't do that for us. But look, they have this up because they believe that baptism is part of salvation. So they have this idea that I'm going to get baptized on behalf of this person, and that's this whole doctrine is based on this one verse. It's based on this one verse, but it's nonsense. Because look, the Great Commission isn't going to all the world and collect people's names so you can get baptised for them. There's nothing remotely like that there. This verse is related to the rest of the chapter, which is about Jesus' resurrection. The question is, why get baptised in the name of Jesus if Jesus didn't rise from the dead? Because here's the thing. Baptism, what does baptism picture? What is, what is baptism anyway? You know, some of you guys here have been baptised. We've gone and, you know, some of you went to the, down to the harbour to get baptised. And we've done it in you know, spa pools and stuff when it's when the weather, weather's inclement. But look, when someone gets baptised, why, why do you go to go some, you know, some water? And you, obviously you ask if someone believes. And if they do, then you, know, you say, I baptise you, know, the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. Down under the water and come up. What does that represent? Well, here's the thing. When you're standing up in the water, remember, Jesus was on the cross. And what happened when he was on the cross? He died. He died on the cross. And what happened then? They took him down from the cross and buried him. And that's what is represented. You're going down and you're being buried. The Bible says buried with him in baptism. And then what happens? Yeah, raised up again. Because what you're saying, it's a picture. It's saying that I believe Jesus died on the cross, was buried and rose again. That's what it is. It's a, it's a public profession of what you believe. But... Does it mean you, someone couldn't get baptised if they didn't believe? Yeah, many people have been baptised who didn't believe, who weren't saved. I mean, a whole pile of Mormons. Yeah. Okay? 
But it doesn't save you because what it is, it's symbolic. You know, it's like I use this example. It's like the example of this this ring. This ring, what does that symbolise? That symbolises the fact that I'm married. But if I took it off, would that mean that I wasn't married? No. You know, if, if, I, if I took it off, it wouldn't mean I wasn't married. Because, you know, because there are people who don't even wear a wedding ring. You know, mechanics and stuff like that, they often don't do that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it's common. You know, but if I, if I put on something else, would that mean, that, okay, they're now married to my wife? No, because this is just a symbol. It's not the actual marriage. Yeah. And it's the same thing. Baptism is a symbol of you believing. And it's believing. Faith. By grace you save through faith that not only sell the gift of God. Anyway, let's get on, because um, we can talk about it for a while, but there's, there's no really, it's, it, it's, a, it's a foolish doctrine. You take one verse and just say, ignoring everything else in the chapter, ignoring everything else in the Bible, and build this doctrine. And look, they did it right at the start, because Joseph Smith, he came up with all sorts of bizarre, crazy doctrines. You know? And this was just one of them. This was just one of them. Anyway, verse number 30. He says, look, and why stand we in jeopardy every hour? Because look, remember, because he's still talking about the same thing. All the way through, it's about Jesus dying, our faith not being vain, he died and he rose again. And that's why he says, look, why are we baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? It's continuing on the same subject. He's saying, look, why are we going through these, you know, these difficult times? Why are we, why are we going through being persecuted for the sake of Jesus dying and rising if he didn't rise from the dead? You see what it's saying? It's, just the, it's the same thought. Let's continue on here. He says, look, I protest by your rejoicing, verse 31, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. You see, Paul goes through a lot on a daily basis because of the hope that he has. Because we believe that Jesus did rise from the dead, we can rejoice even in persecution. Even in persecution. Verse number 32. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus... What advantage does it mean? If the dead rise not, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So he, he said, it's the same thing he said over and over again. If the dead rise not, then why bother? Well, why go out soul winning? Why, why would, why would be the point of going soul winning? What would be the point of someone, you know, maybe slamming a door in your face or, 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 or ridiculing you or, or whatever persecution you, you might enjoy? And sometimes you do have unpleasant experience. Why bother doing that? Why bother reading your Bible? What's the point? Why bother? Why assemble with other believers? Why come to church? Why would you do that? You know, why put in the effort to live a clean and righteous life? Why not just eat and drink and be merry? Well, obviously the reason is because Jesus did rise from the dead. He did rise from the dead. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse number 13. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse number 13. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13 says, We having the same spirit of faith, According as is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 33. Verse number 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. And obviously this verse comes after that one, which is saying, well, why not just eat and drink? But it's like, hang on, be aware, look, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You see, there are consequences for being around evil people. There are consequences for that. They will rub off on you. It doesn't matter who you hang around with. Whoever you hang around with, they are going to... That's one of the reasons why we assemble together. You know, that's what it says in Hebrews. Forsake not the assembly of yourselves together, as a matter of some is, but exhort in one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know, he says we're supposed to provoke unto love and to good works. We're supposed to do that because, look, if you're around good people, if you're around bad people, they will rub off on you. Don't need to turn there, but in Proverbs chapter number 13, verse 20, he says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. You want to make shipwreck of your life? Then hang around with foolish people. You know, find people that are doing the things that you don't want to be doing. Find people whose lives are wrecked, people who are, who are drinking, who are taking drugs, living wicked, sinful lives. Hang around them. What's going to happen? You'll be doing it. You'll be doing it. Look at verse number 34. Verse number 34 says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. He says, Awake to righteousness. Look at Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. And verse number 11, Ephesians chapter number 5, and verse number 11, 
He says, look, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So once again, don't hang around, have nothing, don't have anything in common with these people. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret, but all things are approved, that are approved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Jesus said, this is the condemnation, condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest. Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Paul says, Awake to righteousness, and sin not. But then he says, For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. You see, some of the Corinthians, we know, some of the Corinthians were not saved. Some of the Corinthians were not saved. I mean, isn't that what we saw? I mean, they didn't even believe in the resurrection. <laughs> they didn't believe in the resurrection. So how, how, how are they saved? You know, they had no knowledge of God. Verse number 35. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? You see, when someone doesn't believe, they'll come up with all sorts of reasons and questions. You know, excuses not to believe. They'll go, oh, someone will say, well, well, if the dead are raised, you know, because this is someone who doesn't believe that the dead are raised, say, well, if the dead are raised, well, what sort of body are they going to come up with? You know, are they going to, you know, will they come up, will they have worms on them? Well, you know, what's, it's, it's, just, it's the same sort of thing that, like with Nicodemus. You know, when Jesus said a man's going to be born again, he's like, well, you know, can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? You know? It's a, a, a foolish question. But when someone is not saved, they'll have all sorts of reasons and excuses why they don't need to believe. Verse 36, what's Paul's response? Thou fool. Mm -hmm. Thou fool. That which thou sowest is not quickened or made alive except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but be a grain of a chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it has pleased him. And to every seed his own body. So what he's saying is, look, what is planted is not the same as what grows up. You know, you plant a seed, but it's not a seed that, you know, you get a big seed pops up. Instead, it produces what God has designed it to produce. You know, that's, I mean, in a seed, you've got information that's there. God has designed, this is what, you know, the, the, plant a carrot seed, and it's going to turn into a carrot. That's what it is. Verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. You see, there are different types of physical bodies that humans have, that animals have, that birds have, that fish have. Likewise, celestial or, or heavenly bodies, they're, they're different as well. You know, the, the moon and the sun, they're not the same. You know, you look up in the sky, you can tell they're not the same. You know, they've got different, different levels of brightness. And it's just like the stars as well. Different stars. They have different levels of brightness. Look at verse number 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, is raised in incorruption. You see, in the resurrection, guess what? He says, in the same way that you have a difference, there are different sorts of bodies, and in the heavenly bodies, you've got different sorts, different brightnesses. In the resurrection, there will be a difference in our resurrected bodies. You know, look at, um, keep your finger at 1 Corinthians 15, but look at Daniel chapter number 12. Daniel chapter number 12. Daniel chapter number 12, <clears throat> in verse number 1. Daniel 12 and verse 1, it says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since it was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. But they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. You see, once again, the rewards that you get, 
The brightness that you shine with is determined by what you're doing. You know, if you turn many to righteousness, you know, hey, preaching the gospel to people, people getting saved, that's great. But what about if you turn someone who's living a sinful life and get them in church? You know, what about if you help someone to clean up their lives? Those are things that the Bible says, look, we're rewarded for that. Turn back to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 44. It is sown a natural body. Oh, whoops, I've missed out. Verse number 43, I think we're up to. Verse number 43. It says, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. So obviously, our resurrection bodies, they'll be vastly different mm, yes. than what we have now, you know? I mean, you know, I might not be short and bald, you know? <laughs> Quite possibly. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Verse 44. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. See, the first is the natural body, then the spiritual body. Adam was a type of the natural body. We inherit our fleshly nature from him. I mean, you all know that. You've all got parents, and you inherit stuff from them. You know, maybe their eyes or nose or, you know, <laughs> some features that you, that you inherit from your parents. Well, guess what? We've all inherited from Adam. And we've inherited our fleshly nature from him. But Jesus is called the last Adam. And we inherit our spiritual nature from him. Our spiritual nature from him. Look at verse 47. The first man is of the earth. Earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Jesus. Note again. This is another proof of Jesus' deity. We didn't need any more. It's all right there. The second is the Lord from heaven. He is the Lord from heaven. Look at John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3 and verse number 28. John chapter number 3 and verse number 28. John the Baptist said, Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am set before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. That's Jesus. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. That's who Jesus is. You know, don't you turn there, but in James 2 verse 1, it says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. He says, have not the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. That's who Jesus was, the Lord of glory. Well, who's that? Look at Psalm 24. Psalm 24. Psalm 24 and verse number 7. Psalm 24, and verse number 7. <clears throat> lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. And see, like, you know, pause and you know, think about that. Consider who he is. And we should, you know, when we read through the scriptures, and we say, look, the second man is the Lord from heaven. We should think about that. You know, 1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of Godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. That's who Jesus was. God himself became a man, Jesus Christ. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Guess what? He made everything. He made everything. And right back at the start, Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's who Jesus is, the Lord of glory. Verse number 48. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. You see, we are descended from Adam, we bear Adam's image, but the saved will bear the image of the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. The saved will bear the image of the Lord Jesus. Look at um, 1 John chapter number 3, 1 John chapter number 3 and verse number 1. 1 John chapter number 3 and verse 1, it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, 
But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Turn back to uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 50. We'll try and fish up quickly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Many people like to quote um, in Ephesians 5, for example, to say that, look, you know, people who commit wicked sins, they're not going to inherit the kingdom. They're not going to be saved. Look, I'll, I'll just show you quickly. In Ephesians chapter 1, at the start, Ephesians chapter 1, um, it's not Ephesians 1, Ephesians 5, excuse me. Ephesians 5 and verse 1, it says, Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ hath also loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let not be once named among you as become of saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which is not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, here's the verse, for this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And they say, look, see, you're not going to, you know, you're not say, if, if, if you fit into this category. But look, what do we read in 1 Corinthians 15? Flesh and blood clean up and inherit the kingdom of God. Anyone doesn't fit into that category? But of course, that's the thing. No, no, no sinners are going to inherit the kingdom. But when Jesus returns, we won't be sinners anymore. We won't be sinners anymore. Look at verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We're not all going to die. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and when this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall we brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. You see, when Jesus returns, we are going to be changed in an instant, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We'll no longer have our corruptible bodies, instead we'll have incorruptible, immortal ones. Death and sin, they'll be no more. You know, look at uh, Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 18. Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 18. Romans 8 and verse 18, it says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation or the revealing of the sons of God. For the creature is made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit or to know the redemption of our body. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. In the moment, it's twinkling of light, at the last trump. That's what's going to happen when Jesus comes back. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we be with the Lord. We shall come one another with these words. Back in 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse number 55. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we don't have to fear death because of the victory that Jesus has won. Because mm -hmm. isn't, isn't death something that people are consumed with? Mm -hmm. The fear of death. Mm -hmm. The Bible says all our all life subject to the fear of death. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to, because look, Jesus has won the victory. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, so because of all this, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye you know that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. You see, because we believe that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he rose again, he purchased salvation for us. Because of that, 
We should be steadfast in our service to God, knowing that our labour will not be in vain. Our labour will be rewarded. This chapter is commonly referred to as the resurrection chapter. The resurrection chapter. Paul underlines the fact that if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then we won't rise from the dead. And our faith is vain. But what does it say in verse 20? But now is Christ risen from the dead. That's why Paul was willing to go through so much tribulation, so much persecution. But look, and the Bible says, look, yea, and all that will of God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Paul lived a godly life, and so what happened? He suffered a lot of persecution. A lot of persecution. Look, I mean, just quickly, look at, um, look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. And verse number 24. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. And verse number 24. <clears throat> he says, Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. So you received 39 lashes five times. Ooh. Five times. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger, in thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. I mean, Paul had it pretty rough. He had it pretty rough. He went through a lot because of his faith. And look, we should be prepared as well. The chance are we might not have to go through the, the extreme that Paul did, but some people have, and we should be prepared for that. We should be prepared for it. We should be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, because our labour is not in vain. You see, we will get rewarded. Not be saved because of our work, but we'll be rewarded because of our work. You know, Revelation 22 and verse number 12 says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Jesus said in Matthew chapter number 16, in Matthew chapter number 16, verse number 27, he said, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. Jesus says, I'm going to come back and I'm going to reward you. For the works you do. So what works are you doing? And obviously inherent in that, how is Jesus going to come back and reward people? Because he rose from dead. He was dead. And he's alive forevermore. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray you'd help us to just to realise the truth of the resurrection. We know it mentally, but help it actually to have an impact in our lives, to live our lives in light of the resurrection, that you died and rose again. And because we believe, we will rise from the dead. You said, you, said to, uh, you said to Martha that, you know, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Mm -hmm. Believest thou this? And obviously it's saying, we, you know, we understand we all die physically unless you come back first. But our souls don't die. We don't experience the second death. And at the last trump, when you return, we'll be raised incorruptible with those that have been before us. So whether we, whether we, whether we pass on or whether we're still here when you return, help us to be steadfast, Lord. Help us to be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that our labour is not in vain in the Lord. We thank you and praise you and love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.